So we're here, right? I'm, I'm on the right one. All right, so the first thing we wanted to do, and I did tell you to ask you to try it, so we'll just kind of work through this first part together for sure. Um, we're going to sketch a slope field for the given differential equation at the eight points indicated. Okay, so that should kind of tell you something about what's going on on the y-axis, right? So when x is 1 and y is 0, then that means I'm, my slope is what? When x is 1 and y is 0, so I'm at 1, 0, then it's 1, okay? And remember, you can kind of eyeball, so like if my slope was 1, I would go up 1 and over 1, so I can kind of think about trying to, gosh, and kind of think about drawing it like through that negative 1. So it would look something sort of like that. All right, and that's a positive 1, right? All right, so then... When x is 1 and y is 1, then my slope is 2, so it'll be steeper, and it would be nice if it actually went through the point. I don't know what the heck is happening. Okay. I don't, I don't know. It, just, that, it looks steeper. I know I didn't really hit the point, but I don't. <sighs> Wouldn't that be nice? I think I might, I might just end up going back to my document camera. It's driving me nuts. All right, so then when x is 1, and y is negative 1, what's my slope? 0. All right, so then when x is negative 1 and y is negative 1, what's my slope? 0. When x is negative 1 and y is 0, my slope is negative 1. When x is negative 1 and y is 1, negative 2. And that is what your slope field looks like. I forgot the twos, thank you, because it does say eight points and that's only six. All right, so then when x is two and y is zero, what's my slope? One half, so that's not as steep, right? So it's not, it's not as important, I mean, it's important for you to try and make that kind of look like one, but the most important thing is that the two looks steeper and the one half looks less steep. I mean, that's kind of the most important thing. So then when x is negative one and y, I'm sorry, negative two and y is zero, I have negative one half. We good? All right. So then we want to find the particular solution with this initial condition. Okay, so let me get my first step done here before I scroll. So I'm going to, I want to multiply both sides by dx. So let me just do that. So I've got dy, actually let me just rewrite it. dy dx is equal to, I don't know, is 1 plus y. It was not doing this earlier, so I don't really don't know what the heck is going on but it's like moving. All right, so that's what I have, right? All right. So then I'm going to, and you can kind of do it all in one step. Like I want my x to stay on the right. My one plus y is gonna move over to the left. So I get one over one plus y dy equals one over x dx. It's like alive or something. That says 1 plus y. I'm not rewriting everything that looks like trash, unless you just can't figure it out. Whew. Okay, so now that I'm here, all my y's on one side, all my x's on the other, I'm going to integrate, right? Now, when you do this, I have one, it's not just 1 over y, it's 1 over 1 plus y. So you want to at least think through your u substitution, okay? Because it's not always just the natural log of what you see. In this case, if u was 1 plus y, du would just be dy, so we'd be fine. And then when we integrate, this just really stays the same. The times where it really, really is going to matter is if y is negative or there's a coefficient in front of y. Okay, so you just want to kind of be careful with that so you don't fall into a trap. So this is going to be the natural log of the absolute value of 1 plus y equals the natural log the absolute value of x plus c. Okay, we all good with that? All right, so then I need to solve for y. Now, here's what, and I, I think I told y'all there's been much discussion. Even Monday in our training, there was a lot of discussion about do we go all the way to solve for y? Do we not? Why? Ms. Bruce told me she was working a ton of questions on Sunday because I'd asked these questions and trying to figure out which way is the best way. What it boils down to is this. You can do it either way. 
the most efficient way that I have found from working all these different problems is that if you have the natural log in here, it's good to get rid of the natural log and solve for y. Okay? You don't have to solve all the way for y. I'll tell you what I mean by that in just a minute. Um, and, and then the other cases, other things are, are going to come up, and I'll get, to, I'll get to that when we get there. So what I want to do is the way that we do this. Now, I've been rewriting it like the, the, not, uh, the base is e, so e to this, and you can rewrite it as an exponential. But really, you can also just say, I'm going to take e to the power of both of these. Does that make sense? So I'm putting my little e's in there. So when you do that, that knocks out the natural logs. I am solving for y. You don't have to completely erase if you didn't solve for y. OK. So I'm solving for y. I didn't divide by e. I'm taking e to this power equals e to this power. It's kind of like taking the natural log of both sides, but I'm raising e to the power of both sides. That's why I'm putting the little e down there. So when you do that, e to the natural log of anything is going to leave you with the absolute value of 1 plus y. OK? So I get the absolute value of 1 plus y. You with me on that? That equals to, now over here, I'm going to rewrite this just a little bit differently so I don't lose you. This becomes e to the natural log of the absolute value of x plus c, right? Well, it did, it straight canceled over here, but this is two terms. You can't always do all that, right? You with me on that? So I'm going to just rewrite this absolute value of 1 plus y equals, so then this can become e to the natural log of the absolute value of x times e to the c because we know what our exponent, our exponent properties are, right? You with me on that? e to the c, this guy right here, he's just a constant, right? All right, so that means he comes out in the front, and he's just going to be c, right? Well, this is like times this, but here, yes, now these kind of take care of each other. So I get the absolute value of 1 plus y equals the absolute, or let me put c in the front, c times the absolute value of x. Make sure you understand where everything came from. Now, let's talk about when we drop the absolute value signs. Okay, so let's just say that the absolute value, um, just a little side note here, the absolute value of x is equal to 5, right? So if I wanted to solve for x, then that means plus or minus x is actually equal to 5. So x is equal to plus or minus 5. Does that make sense to you, since it's the absolute value? So technically, when you solve an absolute value, whatever is inside gets the plus or minus on it, but you can always just multiply it through and get on the other side. When that really matters is when we're solving inequalities. I don't know how much that'll come up. I just want to make sure that you understand your actual um, algebraic rules. So here, plus or minus 1 plus y equals, oh, let's just do this, plus or minus 1 plus y is equal to c times the absolute value of x. Now here is what is nice, is that when I multiply both sides by plus or minus, this becomes plus or minus c. Until we know what c is, those plus and minuses just gets absorbed, and c will come out what it's supposed to be. Kind of like if I multiply by 2, I don't get 2c. You with me on that? So when I multiply through, and I'm just changing the sign on this, I don't even know what it is yet, so I don't even care. Like plus or minus c is just c, because it's just some constant. So I end up with 1 plus y equals c times the absolute value of x. I can't drop this one, but I can drop that one. You with me? All right, so now that I've gotten rid of the absolute values and the natural logs, I can, go ahead. Yes. OK, so let me erase this one step, and then I will. Let me just say, we're going to insert step here. That's what I'll do instead of erasing it. So the step, the step I kind of skipped is that 1 plus y is equal to plus or minus c times the absolute value of x. Okay, do you see how I'm just basically multiplying both sides by plus or minus to try and get the 1 plus y by itself? 
Okay, but plus or minus C, I don't know what C is. So it's just, it's kind of like if I, like if we had the, um, okay, another little just side note that I'm going to erase. If I had, uh, let's see, one half Y equals 3X plus C, right? And I'm solving for Y. When I multiply it through by 2, that just gives me Y equals 6X, and it's still just plus C because C is just some constant. And it could be positive, it could be negative. And the, the fact about whether it being positive or negative will just take care of itself when we figure out what C is. It kind of cancels itself out, yeah. Yes, yes, C is either positive or negative. We don't know yet, it's just in there. Okay, you with me on that? All right, so that's why we get to drop. Okay, so that's one of those lines. It's just gonna stay there, I don't know why. Um, that's why we get to drop this one, right? Or not just drop it, but when we drop it, we get the plus or minus, but then that's why it just kind of goes away anyway, and it's just kind of being dropped. We can't drop this one, though, because we haven't done anything with it yet. We all good with that? Okay, so then this step here, so I'm going to erase this. This step here, I'm going to kind of put a little star by or do something like this is where I'm going to substitute in to find C and then that's where I put C back into when I'm done. You with me on that? Or we could go ahead and solve all the way for Y. It really doesn't matter either way. But now when I do this, what was my initial condition? Um, okay, so X is negative 1, Y is 1. All right, so I'm going to substitute it in here. So 1 plus 1 equals C times the absolute value of negative 1. Does that make sense? So 2 equals C. So then when I put it back into here, I get 1 plus Y equals 2 times the absolute value of X, because that was C. My jacket's drawing, just ignore that. Um, and then that means that y is equal to 2 times the absolute value of x minus 1. Am I good? Okay, and we leave that absolute value. because We're not trying to solve for x, we're trying to solve for y. And that's what we get. Okay, what questions have we got? All right, did we try anything else? All the ones that weren't word problems? Okay, that's fine. That's fine. So, we skip that one? It was very similar. Was it exactly the same? Okay, and that's what, when I was working it too, and I, I think it is because even, there's something else. Is this one the exact same as another one? No. Okay. It was that one, okay. That's why I kind of mixed their notes, and I think that they both have the same thing, but on different days, and that's also why I was confused about what I had done and what I hadn't done, because I'd worked both, and then everything starts looking the same, and then I don't know what the heck I'm doing. All right, let's jump to number five, since number six was the same as another one. So we're here. Y'all see where that is? We skipped the word problem for now. We're probably going to do the baby bird one today, but... All right, so we're going to find the particular solution. All right, so that means that we've got, let me just rewrite it, dy dx is equal to y minus 1 over x squared. All right, so then I'll have 1 over y minus 1 times dy equals 1 over x squared dx. If you have y to the first power in the denominator, I would leave it in the denominator because that's going to be your natural log when you integrate, right? If you have any other exponent in the denominator, me personally, I would rewrite it as a negative exponent. I think that makes it easier. Okay, so then um, this is going to give me 1 over, I'm just going to rewrite this, y minus 1 dy equals x to the negative 2 dx. And then integrate. That's right. So at this point, I've got the x's and y's on both sides. I like how my exponents look, and I'm going to integrate. Again, I'm going to think about u substitution here. 
I don't have to worry about doing anything fancy because like if this was 2y minus 1, then I would because when I do du and dy is not going to be the same. So, but this is fine. So this is just going to give me the natural log of the absolute value of y minus 1 equals. Then I'm going to add 1, which makes it negative 1. So it's negative 1 over x plus. Everybody with me? All right, so again, I would solve for y, and I've been rewriting it, and what I've been doing is, is not wrong, because I, I was just thinking about rewriting this as an exponential, which is the same thing as taking, putting e down here on both of these, but Ackerman and um, Bruce both do it that way, so I, I don't know if there's like another reason we need to. It's still the same thing. So, yeah, when you put the e's down here, or if you put e to this power equals this, it's the same thing. So it makes, you'll, you'll, when we, it'll be on different sides of the equal sign, I think, but it's still the same thing, and you're fine, okay? But again, there may be another reason why we like writing it this way for reasons that I don't know that are important yet, or don't remember, because it's not like I have never done this, it's just... Um, all right, so when I do this, this becomes the absolute value of y minus 1 equals, and then... I'm going to go ahead and write this. So it's e to, this is my, um, my whole exponent. So this is really e to the negative 1 over x times e to the c, right? That says negative 1 over x, even though it looks like, I don't even know what it looks like, an up down, upside down 7 or something. Um, so then that means that the abs, absolute value of y minus 1 equals c times e to the negative 1 over x. So now, when I drop the absolute value signs, that's where the plus and minus comes into play. Is it going to matter here since I have a C there? No, it doesn't. It's totally fine. So that means I have, and I'll just kind of move this up here. So this gives me Y minus 1 equals C times E to the negative 1 over X. So Y is equal to C times E to the negative 1 over X plus 1. So now here is where I'm going to stop. I have solved for y because it's a natural log. If there was not a natural log in there, I probably would have substituted for c a whole lot sooner. Okay? And I looked quickly for some other, I think these all kind of have the same situation right now, but we're going to find some others we can work through so we can make sure to know what to do when it's not natural log. Um, my initial condition is 2, 0. So this is 0 is equal to c times e to the negative oops, negative one half yes plus one okay then I'm trying to solve for C at this point right so I subtract one so negative one equals C times e to the negative one half that is totally fine right here okay that's totally fine y'all good with that so let me just Negative 1 equals c times 1 over the square root of e, or even if it's e to the 1 half power, it's fine. So now, because I want to get c by itself, I multiply both sides by what? Where did what? Okay, is everybody with me? Let me know if you don't know where something came from. Okay, hopefully by now we're used to things looking weird, so we just got to go with it when it's weird, just make sure we're confident in what we did. Please stop me if something doesn't make sense. Okay. So I'm going to multiply both sides by the square root of e. So this just gives me negative square root of e equals c. So this is where I'm going to substitute it back into. I made myself a little note because there's all kinds of places I can put it. But we have to put it back in the right spot in case we have multiplied through or done something like that. So that means this is going to give me y equals negative. Now I'm going to rewrite this as e to the one-half power, I'm going to show you why in just a second, times e to the negative 1 over x plus 1. Now, for a free response question, which this technically is, leaving it as the square root of e, totally fine. Okay, I could have totally had a square root of e there and everything would have been fine. But remember, we have to try and figure out if this was a multiple choice question, it probably wouldn't look like that and we have to make sure that we know what we're doing with this. Okay, does that make sense to you? 
So we could have stopped, well, I could have put a square root of E right here. We could stop, we'd be fine. Okay, but for multiple choice answers, I that could have been an answer, this could be an answer, or it could be Y equals negative E. Now what happens when we multiply the bases? What do we do with the exponents? Add them. So that'd be negative one over X plus one half and then plus one. That's another version of it. Your safe stop is before that, but remember, we gotta, we gotta try and match things up sometimes. You have to decide that what you have is the same. <clears throat> what questions you got? Okay, we're all good? Okay, okay. So let's look at the next one that's not a word problem, and then we'll come back to our little, oh, was that it? Was that all of them? Oh, that's right, because I thought we hadn't. Okay, so let's look at this baby bird question. What did I not do? Oh, because it was the same one as the exact same one? We've already worked it. Exact same one. Um, 2012, number five. Okay. All right, so the rate at which a baby bird gains weight is proportional to the difference between its adult weight and its current weight. At time t equals zero, when the bird is first weighed, its weight is 20 grams. Okay, so um, b of zero equals 20. I think it goes on and tells us that again somewhere else. If b of t is the weight of the bird in grams at time t days after its first weight, then here's your derivative. dB dt is this equation. It says let y equals y equal b of t be the solution to the differential equation above with the initial condition b of 0 equals 20, because that's when it's first weight, okay? So A says, is the bird gaining weight faster when it weighs 40 grams or when it weighs 70 grams? And explain your reasoning. So what are we even going to need to do on A? How do I, how do I know how fast it's gaining weight when it weighs 40 grams. Plug in 40 grams to what? Yeah, isn't this DBDT, it clearly says the rate at which the baby bird gains weight is proportional, and that's what this is. This is your rate, okay? The rate at which it gains weight. We good? They gave me the rate. So I have to figure this out. I'm going to take dBdt. I'm probably going to hear it. Let me make sure I'm looking at mine because otherwise I'm going to have to scroll a thousand times. Okay. Um, I'm going to take dBdt and I'm going to evaluate it when x equals 40. Oh, not when x equals 40. When b equals 40. Thank you. <laughs> when b equals 40. Right? So that means I'm going to substitute it into what they gave me. So this is one-fifth times 100 minus 40. So this is one-fifth times what? 60. And that is, is that 30? It's not 30. It's going to be 12. It's okay. It's 12. And then what are our units here? Grams per days. And I, it doesn't really ask me that right now, but that is something that we want to make sure we're paying attention to. <laughs> okay. Are we good? Okay. So um, that's what's happening then the rate at which it's changing when it weighs 70 grams, I substitute that in. So one fifth times 100 minus 70 equals one fifth times 30. What's that? 6 grams 
per day. Uh, it's grams per day, not grams per day, so it doesn't make sense. Okay. Everybody with me so far? All right, so then it says, so we figured that out. So is it gaining weight faster when it weighs 40 grams or when it weighs 70 grams? 40, okay? So then it says explain your reasoning. Let's use some words. So is the bird gaining weight faster? So I would say the bird is gaining weight faster when it weighs 40 grams because, and then there's a few different ways you could say it. You could use a whole lot more words, or you could say DB, DT evaluated at B equals 40 is greater than DB, DT evaluated when B equals 70. Probably, I don't see why not. Because this, because you, because you all, because what you can't do is you can't just say this and not have this to back it up. So like that is your backup. So I don't see why you couldn't do that. That makes sense to do that too. Okay. So let's talk about. Let me find. I have the scoring guidelines over here because I wanted to talk about the scoring of this what we would have gotten points for so far. Okay, so you get a point, check this out. You get one point just for using DBDT. Even if you don't use it right, you knew that that was the rate at which it was gaining weight and you tried to use it even if everything was, else was a hot mess. That's one point, right? This is why we don't leave anything blank. You know it's a rate, we're gonna do something with it, right? And then um, you got another point for the correct answer with reasoning. And yeah, okay, we're all good with that. Questions? All right, so let's look at the second part. So this says, oh, that's a good question. Like, what if what if you got fifteen and eight or something yeah. like that here? That's a very good question. Um, it says answer with reason. And I mean, according to the rubric, now there's usually in a whole nother page that has all those little stipulations there, but that's a great Miss Bruce question, and I'm gonna make a little note of this. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, so if you have a 50-50 chance of guessing, you're absolutely right. But if you have nothing to back it up, that's bad, right? Like that, they're not gonna take that, because then you did just guess. Um, but yeah, right. Then you would have still gotten, yeah, okay. I'm going to make a little note and I'm going to ask everyone else. Very, very good question. Okay, so let's look at B. So B says find the second derivative in terms of B and use the second derivative to explain why the graph of B cannot resemble the following graph. So it's not asking you if it can, it's telling you it can't, you explain why, okay? So we have to find the second derivative. So I'm gonna write down the first derivative first. So I've got db dt, because I can't see it, um, is equal to one-fifth times 100 minus b, okay? So when I take the second derivative, That is equal to, well, this one-fifth is just, I mean, this whole thing, this is just a constant. It's just going to be zero. But this negative b times one-fifth will give me negative one-fifth. But it's not just negative one-fifth. It's negative one-fifth db dt. Okay? Which means then I have to substitute 
this part back in right there. Right? Remember doing that? So then this becomes negative one fifth times one fifth times one hundred minus b, okay, which is equal to negative one over twenty five times 100 minus b. I still wouldn't distribute or anything. Okay. So let's think about, because all it says is explain why it cannot resemble the following graph. All right, well, we know that the following graph looks like it's increasing the whole time, right? It also looks like it is, um, we have concave up and concave down, right? Well, increasing the whole time, we can't really figure that out from the second derivative, right? But from the second derivative, if we think about our fun box here, the second derivative Second derivative doesn't tell me about increasing and decreasing, but it does tell me about concave up and concave down in points of inflection, right? And so we have, let's see if we, what we can figure out from this second derivative. We know that from this graph, okay, from this graph here, we've got concave up and concave down. Um, and from this, let's see, that's gonna be positive the whole time. Right, so since it's positive the whole time, right, so the value of B from that graph is between 20 and what was it? 100, right? Because we know it's equal to 20. It's it's greater than or equal to 20, and then I'm not really sure about 100. So I just left it like that. So since B is between 20 and 100, when you substitute numbers in here between 20 and 100, right, then your second derivative answer is going to be negative every single time. Does that make sense? So the second derivative is always negative. If the second derivative is always negative, then it's always concave down. And that is why, okay? So, therefore, so I have all of, I found this, and then I can say, therefore, the graph of B is concave down for this and let's see not sound that's probably not a good way to oh. and part of the given graph is concave up. Okay, so when you are given a question like this, and you're like, I'm not even sure what the heck I'm supposed to do. So the nice thing is, is they told you to find the second derivative, right? So then you have to ask yourself, what do I know about the second derivative? What does the second derivative tell me, right? What, what kind of information do I get from that? And from the fun box right here, this is what we know, whether it's a graph or a function, but um, that's how I'm going to figure that. And it also told me to use the second derivative. It didn't tell me to use the first derivative, which they gave me. It told me to use the second derivative, and so that's what I end up with there. Okay, are we good? What questions do you have? Do you still have some room to write? Okay. So then it goes on to say on C, use the separation of variables to find B, basically. So let's go here. So this is on part C. I'm going to rewrite it again because I can't see it. DB DT is equal to one fifth times 100 minus B. So this is the other thing I want you to get from this right now is that 
yes, this is a differential equation. It even tells you that, but we haven't separated and integrated yet, right? But then they tell us to. It says, use separation of variables. So then we're going to find the particular solution. So we separate this, db, so I'm going to get 1 over 100 minus b equals 1 fifth dt. Oh, I forgot my db over here. Sorry. db. Now I'm going to integrate. Now over here on the left, I have my variable in the denominator. It's to the first power, so I know this is going to be a natural log situation. But it is a negative b. It's not just b, right? So if you think about this, and again, you don't have to actually do the u substitution and go through all that, but if we think about what that means, u, if we make u equal to 100 minus b, then du is equal to negative db. And so since this is, I would have to make that negative, I need a negative on the outside. So when I integrate this, this gives me the negative natural log of the absolute value of 100 minus b. And that's equal to 1 fifth what? T, good, plus c. And I don't want to substitute yet because I want to uh, get rid of my natural log, but first I want to multiply through by my negative. Would you agree with that? So when I do that, then I'm going to get the natural log of the absolute value of 100 minus b is equal to negative 1 fifth t and then plus c. Because remember, all that, that sign, whatever we multiply through by before we find c, it'll just get all absorbed and things will be fine because it's just some constant. Now, I take both e to the, ooh. so when I do this, on the left, I'm left with the absolute value of 100 minus b equals e to the negative 1 fifth t times e to the c. Bless you. Any questions about where anything came from? Okay, so now, since this is just going to become C times, so let's see, 100 minus B, I'm going to drop those because we've got C times E to the negative 1 fifth T. And it's okay to drop them because the plus or minus gets absorbed right there. And then I can, I can substitute right now or I can solve for B completely. What, do you, what would you rather do? Solve for b? Okay. So that means that negative b is equal to c times e to the negative 1 fifth t minus 100. So b is equal to c times e to the negative 1 fifth t plus 100. Now we can substitute. What is my initial condition? 0, 20. So that means that 20 is equal to c times e to the 0 power plus 100. What's e to the 0? 1. So negative 80 equals c. Then I substitute it back into here. So b is equal to negative 80 times e to the negative 1 fifth t plus 100. Did it ask us to do anything else? No, it didn't. Actually, it, 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 no, it didn't. Max two out of five. Okay, so here's what you get your points for. I, lo I left my watch at home, but let's talk about points. You got points for, you got a point for the separation of variables. Boom, that's one. You got a point for taking the antiderivative, boom. Um, constant of integration, we found C, boom. We used the initial condition, boom. And then we solved for B. Like, there are our points right there. Okay. 
All right, so whatever you haven't done, see, we did the baby bird. If you didn't rework the one we already worked, do that. Go back and then 2000, the 2011 one, read it, see what you can do, write down at least what you know, what you're looking for, those sorts of things, okay, even if you can't work the problem.